years ago, I was a Fulbright Scholar to Bangladesh. And while I was there, I was confronted with this picture. Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, and this is the capital city of Dhaka. You can see the urban jungle in the background, a river running through the city, but the river is being choked off by both pollution and uncontrolled development. Making matters worse is this one. Bangladesh, much of Bangladesh is only a few feet above sea level. If sea levels rise by three feet, 20 million people in Bangladesh will be displaced. That's the population for the entire state of Florida. When sea levels rise, not only would communities get displaced, but the sea level, the sea water rushing inland will also salinate our riverways, and of course, that will have an adverse impact on fish life and plant life. So when we are facing such overwhelming odds, what do we do? How do we, how do we react to this? Let me ask the question another, another way. Let's say you knew the world was coming to an end and you had a tree sapling in your hand. What would you do? You knew the world was coming to an end and you had a tree sapling in your hand. What would you do? The correct answer is to plant that tree. And this was beautifully captured in the very popular uh, Disney Pixar movie, WALL-E. If you remember that movie, the earth was essentially a giant wasteland. Uh, people had left the earth. Uh, the only thing that survived was one robot, Wally, and his good friend, a cockroach. <laughs> and what brought this earth back was that one sapling. So it can be done because there is nothing more beautiful and enduring than optimism in the face of overwhelming odds. Now, when we look at the situation, um, we have to ask ourselves, do we not realize how perilous our Earth has become? Are we unmindful of all these things that are literally staring at us at our face? And the answer is not necessarily. We do have an understanding. Take a look at this opinion poll from Pew Research. Seven in 10 Americans believe that global warming is a serious problem. Six in 10 believe that global warming is caused by human activity. Eight in 10 Americans believe that uh, pollution of our waterways, rivers, air, toxic dump, all of these issues are of grave concern. What we lack is collective action against these concerns. Concerted collective actions at a major slave level, at a high scale level. So let me ask you another question. If you were faced with the following choices, which would you choose? Economic development at the expense of economic degradation or ecological preservation at the expense of economic development? Well, this question is not as far-fetched as you think. Gallup has been asking this question for the last 15 years. And two things concern me about this picture that you see. One is that as we have more data about the danger the planet is in, more people are favoring economic development over environmental stewardship. So the trend lines are actually moving in the wrong direction. But part of the problem that we have with this picture is it's the wrong question. It's a wrong question because we have traded, we have implicitly assumed that there is a trade-off, an irrevocable trade-off between economic development and environmental stewardship. But the reality is that both can be done. It is not more of one leads to less of the other. This zero-sum game is the precise problem that we have. So we have to change this mindset, we have to change this frame of reference. And we are beginning to do this. We are beginning to do this through a new frame where we say that our well-being depends upon three circles. And the intersection of those three circles is where sustainability rests. It's people, planet, and the profit. 
So profit making cannot be devoid of stewardship of the planet and social responsibility. It has to be integral to it. And profit making should not view the stewardship of the environment or social responsibility as an impediment, but rather it should view those as a source of growth and innovation. But who is going to do this? And the answer is it will require unprecedented cooperation between governments and businesses. Neither side can do it alone. It will have to be in a cooperative framework. And this was, the good news is that we are beginning to see some traction in this area, although the cynics may not concede that point, but in reality there is some traction. In the year 2000, the United Nations, which as you know is a body made up of representatives of governments, came to a startling conclusion that some of the biggest challenges facing humanity cannot be solved only through public policy. It will require voluntary cooperation of businesses. And so they put out a document where they invited businesses to voluntarily sign on to this document and show progress. And that document said that businesses should continue to do their profit making, which is the core purpose of a business, but while pursuing profit making, they should also pay attention to 10 universally accepted principles that were structured around human rights, labor rights, environmental stewardship, and anti-corruption. And thus was born this concept that we call the UN Global Compact. And as you can see, when this was started about a decade or so ago, not many businesses signed on to this document. This was a voluntary process. Nobody was coercing anybody to do this. But today, over 5,600 businesses around the world have signed on to this document, and 243 U.S. corporations have signed on to this document. And thus, what are businesses now saying? That their, their, their pursuit of profit-making would be done while being cognizant of these other concerns. It is a much more holistic framework of pursuing business interests, pursuing economic value, than the framework that we have been traditionally used to. Now, one of the misconceptions that many people have when they think about sustainability is they think about sustainability as an environmental activism issue. And the stewardship of the environment is only one component of sustainability. The second leg of sustainability rests on the notion of social responsibility. Because we know from economic research that when so economic systems become imbalanced, it hinders economic growth. And let me show you an example of this. Between the years 1917 to 1979, for every dollar of income growth that happened to us as a nation, 69 cents went to people in the bottom 90%, 31 cents went to the people at the top 10%. Generally, one may conclude that was a fairly equitable way of distribution. Notice what happens in the following 30 years. In the following 30 years, for every dollar of income growth, 98 cents went to the top 10%, and 2 cents went to the bottom 90%. That's imbalance. That's imbalance. That's not sustainable. That's not good for business. Another picture that paints or tells a similar, a similar story, this is the ratio of CEO pay to average worker pay. Today in 2011, that's the last point that, data point that we have here, for every dollar that an average worker made, the CEO made $231, a ratio of 231 to 1. That's the good news, it is down from 417 to 1. But the bad news is that historic averages has been around 20 to 1, between 1965 to almost 75 uh, or even the early 80s, we were in the 20 to 30 range. And we did plenty fine during that time. So who is going to address such imbalances? The good news is CEOs are going to address that imbalance. And they recognize this, this challenge. Getting 9 out of 10 people to agree on anything is a miracle. But here we have it. Nine out of 10 CEOs believe that sustainability will be critical to future success. 
critical to future success. Nine out of 10 want to employ new technologies to address sustainability issue. Therein lies the concept of innovation and growth. Sustainability is not a cost center. It is an investment that will spur future growth. A future growth that is much more holistic, much more balanced than the imbalances that we have been confronted with in the last three or so decades. And businesses are responding. A recent survey showed that not only large businesses, which are obviously concerned about brand reputation and preservation of, of reputation, not only large businesses, but even small and medium-sized businesses are positively responding. You know, in a recent survey, 79% of large companies, those valued at $1 billion or more, have said that, yes, they are producing, they are putting together comprehensive strategies on sustainability. And, and as I said, even small companies are beginning to see, to see the value of this. And what, in what ways are they making such changes? Not only trying to cut down on emissions and ecological footprint, but also in giving back to their communities. Because it is good for profit making, it is good for value generation, economic value generation, while it is helping others. It is the simple concept of doing well while doing good. And take some examples, quick examples. eBay. The entire business model of eBay is based on the idea of recycling. Because instead of throwing away goods and making them landfill, you can give it to somebody, you can sell it to somebody, make a profit, make some money, but in the process also reduce landfill. GE came up with this, brand of, this brand, uh, line of products called the Echo Imagination line, where they state up front that their goal with this Echo Imagination line is to protect the environment while making it economically viable. Again, the idea that both can be done, it's not one or the other. Starbucks is producing or coming up with a line of organic coffee making. Um, simple ideas, even simple ideas like raising the temperature of their buildings from 72 degrees to 75 degrees can have a wide-ranging impact. Other examples, Ben & Jerry's has integrated social responsibility as part of their corporate mission, as part of their core corporate strategy. Tom Shoes gives away a pair of shoes to children in need for every shoe that they sell to a paying customer. So there is hope. People are, businesses are setting good examples. It is for consumers now to demand more from such businesses and also to make sure that our public policy is in tune with the change that we are seeing on the ground. But there's another component to the sustainability equation. The another component is academia. Because the next generation of ideas on sustainability will have to start in classrooms before they migrate to boardrooms. So business schools will have to retool the way they deliver business education. For too long, we have been myopic in viewing the goal of a corporation is to solely maximize shareholder value. Yes, that needs to be done, but it is more than that. It has to take into account the three Ps, people, planet, and profit. And business schools are beginning to respond to this. Take a look at this. Just as the UN had put out the UN Global Compact, a similar type of aspirational model has been put in front of business schools. It's called the Principles of Responsible Management Education, or PRIME for short. And the idea in this document is for business schools to voluntarily say that we will retool our education processes so that we train the next generation of business leaders with the idea of sustainability well integrated into their consciousness. So business schools are playing a role in becoming a nexus where we are creating conversations between government, between civic, civil society, between businesses, between academia, and together creating a holistic framework of changing the conversation, changing the narrative going forward. And here is a piece of good news again. In the last four years, five years now, you know, 400 uh, um, uh, business schools around the world, almost 100 business schools in the U.S. have again voluntarily submitted to this document. And so I leave you with this story. A story that you are all familiar with. An old man was walking on the beach and he saw a young girl bending down, picking up a starfish and throwing it into the water. 
So he asked the young girl, why are you doing this? She said, well, the tide is up, the sun is about to come up, and if I don't do this, the starfish is going to die. So the old man told to the young girl, look around you, there are miles of beaches and thousands of starfish. You will not be able to make a difference. So the young girl bends down, picks up a starfish, throws it back into the water, and said it made a difference to that one. So the old man joined, and soon others followed, and change began to happen. Thank you.